In order to evoke emotion, you first need motion. So I literally need everyone to stand up out of their seat and just for one second, shake yourself loose. Just get some new motion into your body. We've been sitting for a little bit now. Just shake, 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 shake. Honestly, shake it, shake it. Trust me, for motion, if you want some emotion, do it with me. All right, sit down, sit down. Thank you. It feels different, right? We're ready for something new. Why don't we all love working? Why is it that some people wake up in the morning full of passion, driven, no matter how many hours they spend at work, they're never tired? And why is it that other people are so frustrated at work, they don't enjoy it at all? They see work as a chore and not as a privilege. When I was young, I thought the goal is financial success. If you want to be happy in life, if you want to make it in life, you have to have financial success. And I'm sure that's what a lot of people think. But then I rethought, why are there so many people that, in my eyes, have enormous financial success, yet they're still unhappy, they're still demotivated? And then there's other people who don't measure their success with their finances and still have that passion and drive to wake up and go to work every single day. So I thought maybe we need to look a little bit deeper. Maybe it's happiness that we're searching for. Maybe it's the simple recognition for the work that we do. Maybe that's what boosts our creativity and our energy. My father told me the story of two trees. If you look at the tree next to you and see how big it is, how many leaves it has, you'll just be cast in its shadow. Instead, focus on yourself. If I only have three leaves today, but I have four leaves tomorrow, and maybe seven leaves by the end of the week, that's growth. That's internal growth. That's not looking abroad how big everyone else is getting. It's focusing on yourself and focusing on your own growth, because you're the one responsible for it. I think it, be it begins with a flaw in our educational system. We all go to school, we all take several subjects, and certain things come easy to us. Other things, things are incredibly hard. Take two students. One is incredible at sports, runs fast, eyeball coordination is perfect, sports comes easy, always excelling in sports. Another student, incredible, mathematical mind, problem-solving mind. When he sees numbers, he sees fun. Now, why would I take that student and force him to run and punish him if he doesn't run as quick as the other student? And vice versa. Why would I take the student that is incredible at sports and force him to become good at math? We too often try to strive in the things we're not naturally good at instead of focusing on the things that we really can do well and the things that we actually enjoy doing. My grandfather told my father, you should become a doctor. And he said, I can't see blood. So he said, become a lawyer. He said, I can't lie. <laughs> so he said, um, what is it that you want to do? And he went to his teacher and he said, I want to sing. And his teacher said, I think it's best to keep your mouth shut. So he became a world famous mime. A lot of things that we naturally enjoy doing, things that are fun, things that are easy to us. For me growing up, it was skateboarding. Now, that doesn't mean I have to become a professional skateboarder when I'm older, but maybe there are elements within that that I can draw from. Maybe there's things I learned skateboarding as a kid that I can use in work today. For me, it all started with the daily challenge. Skateboarding isn't legal everywhere, so you have to first find a spot to skate in. The next thing is you want to learn a new trick. You have to visualize in your head the complication of that trick. What do I really have to do if I want to land that trick? You have to see it in your mind because without that, you're never going to land it. And third, it's not a team effort. It's up to me. If I want to land that trick, I have to practice. I have to fall down, I have to get back up, I have to go as many times as I need to in order to achieve what I'm visualizing in my mind. But when I land that trick, finally, that immediate gratification that I get, that I've set myself a goal and I achieved it, that's something that I use in my life every day. So maybe some of you know what I do today, maybe some of you don't but a short story about my beginnings. I work in a family business. Now, it's not a second or third generation business that I stepped into and was sort of forced into. It's something that happened naturally. We decided as a family, we wanted to start our own business together. And it all started with the passion of my mother. My mother married my father, who, as I mentioned before, was a mime, at a very young age. And they would travel the entire world. They would be out for three months in India, two weeks in Brazil, half a year in Japan. They would be all over the world. And while he was performing on stage and practicing, she would be in the markets. She would get a 
essence and a feeling of the city by capturing the soul of that place through its food. It's something she didn't learn how to do. It's something that purely interested her, and she had an understanding for it. So after the entire journey, when they would come back home to Vienna, the thing my mother wanted to do for my father is cook him a home-cooked meal. So she would go to the market, and she would look for the spices, but obviously, in Vienna, back in those days, you couldn't find the same spices that they had in India, or in China, or in Mexico. So she had to recreate the dishes from her memory, and sort of go for this today very popular fusion kitchen style. Now that's something that wasn't common back then. It's something that she taught herself how to do, and she noticed very quickly she had an incredible passion and talent for it. So after we all graduated, she said to us boys, I want to live my passion. I feel that cooking is something I naturally do well, it's something that I do full of joy, and I want to make that my work. I had just graduated in Barcelona in management and Spanish. Elior had just graduated from Baden-Baden in event management. We flew to Vienna, and we sat down and we said, OK, we want to open a restaurant. It should be a family business. What's the first thing? We need a name. OK, so we took our initials, Nuriel, Elior, Elon, Nadiv, and that spells Nein. That means no in German. It's not too positive. So we rearranged the letters, and we came up with Nini. I thought, Nini, it's perfect. It has all our initials, families at the core of its essence. Next step, we need waiters. Now, I've never worked in the restaurant industry. I have no idea what to look for in a CV. I could barely carry one plate without dropping it. So I looked at the people, and I said, can I find people who I believe will work well with me, who have that same passion as I have for service, for food, for telling a story? Because the service is the bridge between the concept and the guests. And I can look at endless CVs and have perfect CVs, but you have to find the people who are naturally good at being waiters. At the beginning, all of us did everything. Um, my mom would do a dish, we would look at it, and we'd say, pricing. I didn't study finance. I think it looks like it should cost 7 euros 50. 7 euros 50 fair? Sounds fair? Let's do it. 7 euros 50. Absolutely no idea if that was even a minus or if we're making profit off this dish. But that's how we worked. We just worked like, and ran around like headless chickens, and everyone was doing everything. My mom was in the kitchen, I was doing bar and service, Eder was handling the finances, and we rotated until I was in the kitchen cooking nothing more than an egg, and my mother was doing the finances by spending everything we made. <laughs> so we called my third brother, Elon. He just studied theater in London. And we're like, Elon, we need you to join the company. So Elon flew in. Over time, we saw that each of us within ourselves had unique abilities, things that we hadn't learned but were naturally good at. Although Elon studied theater, he has an incredible mind for details, for numbers. I'm going to say this in a very positive way because he's sitting here, but you're a control freak, Elon. <laughs> what I look at maybe one or two times, he looks at a hundred times, but he enjoys doing that. It's fun for him, and he's really good at it. So today, he runs the entire finance department and the entire production, where this meticulous attention to detail is important to its success. Elior, he studied event management. Turns out he's not so good in big crowds. What he is really good at is talking to the individual, finding the people. He created an incredible atmosphere within our team, and he found the best staff we have till today. My mother, as I mentioned before, incredible cook. She does the kitchen, she does our menus for all the restaurants we have, and she's incredible at it. Me, I grew up dyslexic. So I had a very visual mind. I saw everything in pictures. I had a very aesthetic view of the world. So I took care of branding, marketing. How do we want to present ourselves? How do we want to be viewed by the outside world? And by finding all these unique abilities within us, even though we're one family, even though we're similar, each of us strive in a different field. And together, we could take Nani to a global scale. I think an important lesson to learn from our story is that you don't have to have your own vision from the get-go. It's OK to take the vision and passion of someone else and find yourself within that. A lot of people are nervous. You know, I need to have the big breakthrough idea, and how am I going to start? Focus, rather, on what you're really good at. Follow someone else's vision. Get inspired by someone else and find within that your own passion. There's a theory known as the secret. It's a philosophy to some. And what it entails is what you send out is what will come back to you. So you need to really focus in your mind on what it is that you want. To give you a simple example, 
I have a lot of friends who don't drive by car to the city because they're always saying, I'm not going to find a parking space, I'm not going to find a parking space. And when they get to the city, they never find a parking space. Me, in my mind, I already know I'm going to have a parking space. Every time I go to the city, I always find a parking space. But maybe that's because I go ever by bicycle. That's a different story. <laughs> what I learned at a young age through skateboarding is the importance not only to know what you want, but to visualize it. You need to see in your mind the goals that you have. Otherwise, you're chasing an endless horizon. You need to train yourself to set goals. It's not only important to chase that horizon, to chase that dream that you have in your mind. You need to visualize it. You need to train yourself to set small goals. It can be something as simple as not eating meat for a week. I set myself the goal on Monday. If by next Monday I haven't eaten meat, I get that immediate feeling that I got as a kid skateboarding, that I achieved a goal that I had set myself. Set yourself bigger goals. But get into the habit of setting goals and achieving them. And train your body to learn what it feels like to reach the goals that you set. Take time to do the things you love. Find within yourself what it is that you are naturally good at. We spend 80% of our lives at work. You might as well do it with something that you enjoy, with something that you're naturally good at. And like at the beginning of the speech today, if you want to evoke emotion, you need motion. It's very different to sit down and think about something than it is to actually get up and do it. That's why I wanted you all to get up at the beginning, to just get that feeling of emotion. And if I can leave you with one final thought today, it's find a job that you love and you won't have to work a day in your life. Thank you.